Okay, so I'm going to try and gallop through this a little bit um, so there's time for questions. Um, some of the things will be quite complicated, um, and I think that's important it, um, because this is such a hard problem. Um, and I'll try and sort of emphasize why it's difficult and why there's also reason to be hopeful. Um, and it's great being here. I think this has been an amazing endeavor, and, and I hope we can keep going, actually. Will it, um, Okay, this is the website. This is the book that uh, Mona mentioned. Um, I'm having the horrible feeling that people are beginning to ask me if they want, if there's there gonna be a second edition that gives me palpitations when I think about it. Um, anyway, um, oops. Is this advancing? A bit here. Okay, so I think the, the first thing I'm going to try and talk about is that we've all seen stroke patients and we all think we know um, how to recognize them and diagnose them. Um, but one of the things that has sort of certainly perplexed me uh, and gotten me also interested is just what a difficult syndrome hemiparesis really is. Um, and relative to things like cerebellar ataxia, brachinesia and Parkinson's disease, weakness and myopathy, um, hemiparesis has gotten relatively less attention, but it's really a very complex multifactorial disorder, which I'm going to hope to show you. And then conclusions to be drawn from its complexity can go in two directions. Does it mean we're going to have to treat each component of hemiparesis separately? A little bit like what happens in Parkinson's disease, where we know that the tremor, the bradykinesia, the postural instability, the rigidity, the nightmares, the cognitive difficulties do not all respond in the same way, for example, to DOPA. Um, and are we going to have to take that same approach when it comes to hemiparesis and take each component and try and target it separately based on its mechanisms? Um, or can we find a way to sort of short circuit that and get everything better with a more global holistic approach? Um, now the complexity of hemiparesis was it recognized going back to the late 19th century into the middle of the 20th century, um, which is its dual nature, that it's really made up of negative and positive signs. Um, you can be weak, which is where the term hemiparesis comes from. Um, you can be, you know, uh, lose dexterity, but you can also gain unwanted things. You develop synergies, you develop postural abnormalities, you develop spasticity, you develop compensatory strategies. So in other words, you end up with this mixture of the negative and the positive. And this is what FMR Walsh, a neurologist at Queen Square in the middle of the 20th century, made the case for the dual nature of hemiplegia. But interestingly, even though it's been known for over a century, it gets underplayed. People either choose their favorite, the negative or the positive, and don't really consider how they work together, or sometimes not. Um, so for example, this is the classic look of a patient with chronic moderate to severe stroke. They have this postural abnormality where you see, you know, the depressed and protracted shoulder, you know, the internal rotation of the upper arm, flexion of the elbow, flexion at the wrist, fisting in the hand. Um, and this is even before they even start to try and move. This is ostensibly when they're just trying to keep still on that sign. Um, you can also dissect down to movement. And this is something that we've used a, a great deal where you have the patient sitting with their shoulder and elbow planar. They have friction removed by an air sled. They get weight support by the surface itself. So you're trying to sort of peel back all these components, the weakness and the synergies and compensation so that you can isolate the dexterity deficit, which is present not just in the hand where the term dexterity tends to be focused, but you can also show lack of motor control um, in the upper arm. So, you know, and you can sort of look at what the equivalent of dexterity in the finger and the arm would be is that you can see these trajectories on the right, you know, you coordinate your elbow and shoulder so well that the trajectories remain straight, they have le low variability um, and they hit the target. Um, but, you know, when you have a stroke, you can see that even though your weakness is being compensated for, you're not getting these positive symptoms invading to a great degree, you still have this dexterity problem, okay? Um, so there are all these pieces that you can dissect with different degrees of care 
Um, and then the argument, you know, you have to ask yourself, why do they exist? Um, and what can we do about them? Um, so in a way, stroke and hemiparesis, if any of you, when you move your arms about smoothly, you know, you're reaching for things and you're doing things with your arms and hands, and someone said to you, what do you think the deficit would look like if this system were broken? You would never guess, I don't think anyone would guess that you'd get these things called synergy, spasticity, dexterity loss, weakness. So in other words, there's this huge clue that you're being given about how the motor system and how evolution assembled normal motor control by seeing how it falls apart and what the pieces look like. Okay. So it's both interesting from the point of view of motor neuroscience, which is why on earth was this system assembled like this? And also now that you know Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall, how are we gonna put him back together again? Now, one of the things we know from motor neuroscience is this very interesting observation that goes back quite a while, you know, especially with um, Robinson here at Hopkins, we're looking at eye movements, but then extended and reviewed very nicely here by Reza Shadmir, that neural circuits for control of movement and the circuits for holding still are different, right? That, that, that somehow these have been at least at the level of function been modularly arranged. Now that's interesting, right? Because I've just shown you deficits when the patient is trying to hold still and has that abnormal posture. And I've also shown you these abnormalities and reaching trajectories during movement. Um, so stroke patients have trouble holding still and they have trouble moving. So maybe the neuroscience of the separable circuits for holding still and moving can be informed by what happens in stroke as they have abnormalities in both of those. Maybe the real problem in stroke is that they can't keep them separate, right? So what if that was one of the problems is whatever leads them to be separated in the healthy nervous system they can't be kept apart after stroke. Now that isn't far-fetched given that before motor learning related rehab approaches were introduced in the 70s and 80s, many rehabs, you know, approaches like bow bath, neurophysiological, neurodevelopmental were based on the idea that if you took care of the postural abnormalities, you took care of the spasticity at rest that somehow that, that would benefit the voluntary movement itself. And that fell very much by the wayside. That became sort of not the way to think about rehabilitation. But you know, it may well be that they were onto something and that there is a component that should not be thrown away of that way of thinking. So here's um, a way to measure resting postural forces, not standing up in 3D like I showed you in that cartoon, but you can actually take a look at resting forces on a planar surface, like the one that I showed you the trajectories on, where you can have a robot arm just passively move a patient across the surface, like you can see here, all those black points, um, and basically just have the patient be totally relaxed, let the robot move you, and try and just relax wherever it stops, okay? And Alcazar Joseph, who was a postdoc in the lab, sort of took this approach, um, that was begun actually by that poster I just showed you before by Bob Scheidt and his colleagues um, at Marquette in Illinois. And so what you're seeing here are sort of heat maps of the presence of resting postural forces. And these four squares, you should look up to the upper left-hand side and see that even though the patient is trying to rest their arm at the red dots, you're seeing these flexor biased forces pushing, moving their arm towards their trunk. In other words, they can't relax. Whereas on the unaffected side on the right, you can see almost no vectors in the flexor direction um, because they can relax pretty well on their unaffected side. And then you can look down below and very interestingly, if you support the weight of the arm, you can actually mitigate some of these unwanted rest of flexor biases in 2D, but they don't go away altogether. They're really quite prominent. Okay, so just like the abnormal posture that you see patients who are walking around in the hospital corridor in 3D, they have the exact equivalence in 2D. Okay. 
okay? These intrusion of these resting flexor postural forces, okay? Now, now interestingly, these resting postural forces have characteristics. Um, they correlate with the Fugelmeyer score, which was devised to measure synergies. Um, they also get worse the more extension you try and put on the elbow. So in other words, they're greater magnitude distally than proximally. And they can be modulated, as I just showed you, by weight support. Now, all three of these features, the distal proximal gradient, the modulation by weight support, and the correlation with the Fugelmeyer, are very much what synergies do as well. After all, the Fugelmeyer score is a measure of synergies to a degree, um, which is that the voluntary movement positive abnormality called synergies, the resting postural abnormalities share features with them. Okay, so keep that in mind, all right? So the question you then want to ask is, okay, we accept that there are these resting abnormalities. They have certain features. They have a flexor bias. They have this distal proximal gradient. They get modulated by weight support. Um, what happens when you try and now move through this postural space? In other words, is there any evidence of this abnormality at rest bleeding in to voluntary movement over the same surface? Okay. So here you're just seeing the kinematics. Here's the healthy control on the left. Here's a patient on the right. You know, the healthy control can make a nice smooth movement and come to a stop. What you can see here is the patient is moving, overshooting, and also having some trouble stabilizing at the end. And then you can see the velocity profiles for this. You see the blue initial reach. You have the deceleration in red. You have the coming to a stop that last bump. And then you've got the holding still period after that whole movement period is over. So you've got the blue phase, the red phase, and the green phase. Okay, and remember what we were doing with, with, the, with, the, with probing the surface was looking at what happens in the green phase. Now the question is, is what's the relationship of the green phase to the blue and red phases? Okay, so this is quite an elaborate slide and for the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into all the details. I just want you to get the idea that if we're gonna understand these conditions, this is the level of behavioral analysis that is going to be required. This is the re requisite level of granularity. And what Alcus has done here very interestingly is he said, okay, let me have a look at reaching movements that traverse regions of the workspace that previously were shown, as I just showed you, postural abnormalities in the flexor direction. So does that mean then that if you happen to be reaching voluntarily through parts of that workspace that had the max largest degrees of postural bias, will you detect them interfering with your voluntary movement? Okay. So for example, do they have an effect on your initial part of your trajectory, what's called initial deviation here? Do they have an effect on your deceleration endpoint deviation phase? Okay. And the answer is no. You cannot find evidence in any feature of the voluntary trajectory of the intrusion of these abnormalities which were quite stark when they were resting at exactly the same parts of the workspace. And to really see if this rather surprising result was true, Alka said, okay, well, the, the robot was passively moving them into that space. There wasn't a voluntary phase before they got to the green phase. We sort of artificially put them into the green part. So let's just let them do that themselves and then check after they've come to a complete stop for the presence of these biases by applying perturbations with a torque motor, with a robot. And interestingly, what you see is that indeed now, oops, sorry, you do see the switching on of the abnormalities after the patient has come to a full stop. So in other words, they've got these abnormalities, they are present at rest, they dissolve away during movement, and then they switch back on again once the movement is over, okay? So in other words, it really looks just like the work by David Robinson and then reviewed by Reza Shadmir that the two systems 
keep themselves separated. They may be abnormal, both in the voluntary phase and in the rest phase in stroke, but at least it seems like they're kept separate. Okay, or at least it appears that way. I can, I will talk more about that now. So again, I'm not gonna go through every plot because we don't have much time, but suffice to say that these abnormalities are present and they seem to be separate. And you know, is that good or bad news? Well, it's good news in so much that whatever keeps them separate and healthy subjects is still seemingly operating in 2D in the patients, but it means we may have to target these abnormalities separately. Um, now, another type of uncoupling you can look at, which is also done by Alkis, is you can uncouple the dexterity, the reaching trajectories during movement that I showed you at the very beginning, from the presence of these flexor biases during movement, what are called synergies. Okay, and so here you can see controls again. Here you can see chronic patients with their Fugelmeier scores. The lower the Fugelmeier score, the worse you are. Remember, the Fugelmeier score was devised to capture synergies. And then you have matched Fugelmeier scores acutely. And what's very interesting here is that even though they're scoring the same clinically and acutely on their Fugelmeier scores, their trajectories are worse acutely than they are chronically. So here's another dissociation. It's not between moving and holding still, it's between the positive voluntary intrusions called synergies and the dexterity, um, the negative sign that you get when you get a stroke, okay? So again, I'm not expecting you to be able to capture all of this and understand all of it. What I'm trying to say is that you can decompose the paretic deficit into these different components. Um, and what's really interesting, of course, is that all of these are joined and assembled for normal movement, and then they fall apart in this particular way. Now, what's going on? Okay, now, humans are both blessed and cursed because they have the best corticospinal tract. Okay, this is the pathway that emanates primarily from the primary motor cortex, but it also emanates from premotor and sensory areas. Um, also known, but not exactly the same as the pyramidal tract, um, which is really the cortical spinal tract once the uh, twigs going off to brainstem nuclei have collateralized, and then it's just down into the spinal cord. Um, this tract is, is what you can blame for the dexterity of your arm and hand. But unfortunately, in humans, we put all our eggs in this one descending pump basket so that when it's damaged, we're devastated. Um, more than, for example, even chimpanzees. Uh, and we can talk about why is it that even our closest primate cousins are less devastated compared to us when this tract is interrupted anywhere along its path up from the convexity through the glona radiata, down through the internal capsule, through the midbrain, pons and down, and then decussating in the medulla. Okay, this is basically what garden variety stroke is. Stroke is a lesion of the cortical spinal tract, motor hemiparesis, I should say, okay? So we're talking about the, a disease of the cortical spinal tract, right? Now, what's interesting in this paper that I've shown up here, this is a paper done with Ulrika Hammerbeck and John Rothwell, is we want you to also take a look at another tract called the reticular spinal tract, which is a tract that emanates from both hemispheres and, can, and decussates bilaterally and synapses in the midbrain and pons. And this more primitive descending pathway is what's thought to be responsible for synergies and postural abnormalities. Now, therefore, at first blush, you could say, okay, you've got some pathways that are, are, are important for the negative symptoms and other pathways for the positive or some kind of division of labor like that. But in this paper with John Rothwell and Ulrika and others, we found that whether it was skill acquisition, whether it was strength, whether it was dexterity, whether it was skill learning, all the blame could actually be attributed 
to the cortical spinal tract. So in red is the cortical spinal tract, and then in blue is the reticular spinal tract emanating from both convexities. And here you're basically seeing varying degrees of cortical spinal tract involvement using um, TMS. And you can see that the Fugelmeyer basically is laddered by how severe the cortical spinal tract damage is, and so is another measure of motor control. But what you see is that the degree of activation of the reticular spinal tract, whether it's present or absent, makes no difference to these measures. So what does that mean? Well, it, it could mean that the way to think about the cortical spinal tract is not just as the controller monosynaptically of muscles. Actually, we know the cortical spinal tract collateralizes all the way along its path, beginning in the striatum actually, and on down, is that the cortical spinal tract should not be considered a controller of muscles. It's a controller of all other controllers. And that when you see the multiplexed hemiparetic deficit, you can have it your cake and eat it. You can say that it's due solely to damage to the cortical spinal tract, but the cortical spinal tract, unfortunately, controls all the other tracts as well as muscles. Okay, so that's bad in terms of you fall apart when you damage your cortical spinal tract, but it's good in so much that perhaps if you were to be able to rescue residual cortical spinal tract, maybe all the components would improve simultaneously. Okay. So in order to begin to continue with this kind of dissection, we're now moving into doing the equivalent for the hand. So this is a manuscript in preparation by Jing Chu, who is a postdoc with us and is now using a proprietary um, sub one Newton isometric force detection device for seven degrees of freedom in the hand to sort of work out exactly what the nature of these components are in the hand, okay? And it's very beautiful that you can actually see in the hand both dexterity problems, in other words, increased variability in the trajectories and resting biases, right? You're drifting over here in the right, even when you're trying to be at rest. So in other words, you're seeing a similar dissociation um, in the hand as I've described for you in the arm. Similarly, you can now do these kind of kinematic dissections in 3D. So now we've come full circle. I showed you the patient cartoon the abnormality standing with the flexed shoulder and elbow and wrist. So the time has come for us to move away from 2D surfaces, which are more tractable, and now start doing kinematic analysis in 3D. So this is what we're doing in Israel and in UCLA, where we're basically using markerless 3D tracking, pose estimation using machine learning algorithms to actually start to do the same kind of detailed dissection in 3D that I've shown you so far in 2D. Um, and here you can see that you can begin to do different tasks, for example, a cup to mouth task in the top row where you're expecting to um, elicit the flexor synergy. And then, the, uh, I mean, the, when you're expecting to be in synergy and then the reaching task below when you're out of synergy. So I hope you can see this nice confluence of neuroscience, physiology, technology, behavioral dissection at the requisite level of granularity to begin to get some insights into what we might do to treat this. And the next step is we're working with Ashish Jaspand, a professor at Austin, who's developed a beautiful actuated bilateral 3D exoskeleton, where the kind of experiments that I showed you that Alcas had Joseph had done, where you can start to perturb during reaching can now be done in 3D with this robot. Okay, because it well, may well be that even though we showed in 2D that postural abnormalities could be dissociated from reaching abnormalities, I suspect that's because the weight support provided planar allows mitigation of invasion by the postural system. But my guess is that when you're in 3D and having to generate your own arm weight support and upregulate the reticular spinal tract, that indeed it may well turn out 
that synergies, the abnormalities during movement, are indeed a bleed over of the postural control system into voluntary movement. So there's an irony that the older versions of rehab may have actually been onto something. Now, that's me trying to show you the steady state behavioral phenotype of hemiparesis and give you a sense of how complex the interplay of these components are and the presumably the interplay of the descending pathways that are generating these components but perhaps they're all under control of the cortical spinal tract as the master descending tract. Okay. But that's all at steady state. I've said nothing about recovery. I've just told you the state of the damaged system. So not about recovery. So, you know, these are results that we've show, you know, these old chestnuts, but I think it's important. So this is work by Steve Zeiler, who's obviously part of the team at, at Hopkins. And basically the idea is that perhaps you can get some insight into the mechanisms of recovery because there are some homo, you know, homologous components to reaching in rodents and humans. Um, this is Colvin Weishaw's famous diagram showing that you're justified in considering both um, behavioral and possibly even physiological homology between rodents and humans. And here's a, uh, a rodent reaching, you know, I think you wouldn't be you could be forgiven for thinking there is indeed some similarity in terms of what they're doing, extending at the elbow, extending at the wrist and hand. Poor, I should say. Um, you can then give a stroke to these mice in their motor cortex, which is the origin of their cortical spot. And it's very important to realize um, that the cortical spinal tract lesion that you induce here, causes a reaching deficit, even though there is no monosynaptic connection in the rodent to the ventral horn like there is in humans, which just makes the point that motor cortex and the cortical spinal tract are not there just to monosynaptically control muscles. They're there to control the entire limb system, even in the absence of the monosynaptic connection. Okay. And then you can induce the stroke, this is reaching to a pellet. They reach about 50 to 60% um, efficacy. It's a difficult task for rodents. Um, you give them the stroke in the motor cortex, you get this deficit. And then what's very important is despite a lot of training, more actually than humans get in rehab units, you never get back to uh, reaching pre-lesion. That's very important because it means that even though they've had weeks and weeks to compensate and find a way to cheat, they can't. All right. And believe me, these animals are hungry and they would want the pellet if they could get it. All right. Now, interestingly, if you do the same thing and you don't wait that week between the lesion and beginning to train them, you can actually get them back up to normal behavior. This is a beautiful result by Steve and his team basically showing that you have a window of opportunity where the training seems to be able to bring you back. Um, whereas if you wait, even though you're getting more training days, you can't do it, okay? So there's a lot of hiding in these data. Um, now, the, the sort of interesting, but nevertheless hopeful paradoxical result in a follow-up paper that we did with Steve was that if you waited, and then you lesioned again, in other words, you extended into premotor the size of the infarct, you could paradoxically actually improve the patient by not waiting the second time around. And so you get this very bizarre result, which is that you can recover fully from the first stroke, even having initially extended the size of the infarct by getting the training going after the second stroke, not within a week, but you start right away, okay? And it's very interesting to see, well, why is it that they could train over a shorter period of time and get up back to normal behavior, but all the training couldn't work if you waited a week. Again, speaking against the possibility of a compensatory mechanism. Okay. And it's not non-specific because if you lesion a non-motor region, um, in, in this case, orbital cortex, um, you get no such benefits. So it's, it's not some kind of bizarre motivating effect of being given another lesion, all right? So there's a window. And this has also been shown in primates. I won't go into detail, but this is one of my favorite studies. But basically they took a monkey on the top here 
and they trained the living daylights out of it every day on a reaching task, a prehension task, whereas they let another animal just spontaneously recover. And what was and the take home message is that if you trained a great deal on the prehension task, you could actually get back to normal behavior. Whereas if you just let the animal get regular therapy, in other words, it would just learn a compensatory response, which you see in yellow. So basically pink is normal behavior, lots and lots of training. You can get back to pink. If you do just, let's just deal with what you can. You get some nice behavior performance wise. You can see you get better, but you're not doing it the normal way. Here the animal does it. Sorry, I keep doing that. Um, very sensitive computer. Um, whereas the, the, up, the animal at the top was willing to take a performance hit transiently in order to try and get it right and eventually pass to the other animal. So the point here is that regular coping therapy, where the idea is just be able to pick up the object functionally, actually hinders true slower recovery. Huge lesson for us in rehab. If you focus on function, you can actually do so at the detriment of true impairment. And these are just two trials in humans, which I don't really have time to go to in detail. This is our trial at, at the top here, where we try to use that window that I showed you in rodents and in monkeys and try and exploit it to get greater reductions by going early at high intensity, high dose. And sure enough, um, doing high intensity, high dose training early is twice as good as the regular dosing of therapy that people get. And then in the CPAS study by the late Alex Dromerick, they very nicely showed that you get more change per unit of training early than late. So together, these studies are very much suggesting that we should be doing a lot more focused on impairment early versus late. Now, a lot of material. I've talked a little bit about what we think the physiology of the steady state is. What about the physiology and the biology of the recovery component? Well, what it isn't is reorganization. So in other words, one of the most abused and misunderstood neuro myths um, out there is that the brain reorganizes. It doesn't, okay? Uh, you can think of your favorite studies and I'm telling you that you've misinterpreted them, all right? Don't have a chance to talk to you about that today, but the, the idea that one part of the brain can take over from another part of the brain, not true, all right? And this is an article that Tamar Makin, your Diedrichsen and I wrote in the Cognitive Neurosciences, and we have another paper that we're revising now, which goes into more detail about that. But if that's true, if John's just made that statement, how do people get back? Good question. Um, and just to go through this, um, these are the studies that some people think prove reorganization. These are classic studies by Randy Nudo, where you see a region of the brain has an, a, a, an infarct. This is before, this is the hand represent, digit representation, and then it ostensibly shrinks, and then you get invasion of other areas. Okay, this is just an artifact of thresholding. And actually, in that was one experiment that was done B, where there was this ostensible increase in the area of digits outside of the original area. But two other experiments were done where the animals spontaneously recovered, and these were subtotal infarcts of M1, or they had delayed rehabilitation. In these two groups, they did just as well behaviorally as this group, and there was no expansion that was seen in the original study. So that's what's called sort of selective remembering of data, which is everyone remembers experiment B, but don't realize that you've got just as much behavioral experiment C and D and no such expansion of one area into another. In fact, you had the reverse, okay? And we, in a recent study with Merritt Branchite and others, basically wanted to see whether we could see changes in cortical cortical connectivity using resting state as people recovered so you can see very dramatic recovery in red in the patients. And then we looked to see what was happening in various parts of the cortex, M1, M1, PMD, PMV, parietal cortex, and the functional connectivity between those regions. 
no change whatsoever in those measures over time, and no difference whatsoever from controls that were also longitudinally followed. Okay, so no changes in cortical cortical connectivity using measures that are sensitive enough to pick up much smaller behavioral changes during normal learning that you don't see, even though um, this change in recovery is much larger than where these changes have been seen during normal learning. Okay. So again, more evidence that you do not see reorganization um, in cortex uh, or map changes that are responsible for recovery. So what is going on? Well, what's going on is that you're getting strengthening of pre-existing connectivity, no change of identity down to the spinal cord. This is a beautiful study by Warren and Darling where they basically did a lesion in black or M1 in the lateral premotor cortex. And then they found interestingly strengthening of pre-existing connections down into the spinal cord from the SMA. In other words, here they are already before the lesion. You can see them going down to all the lamina of the spinal cord, cervical spinal cord. And then when you lesion this, you get strengthening of those connections. But again, they were always there. There was no reorganization. There was just strengthening of pre-existing architecture. Okay. So basically this led to the sort of this heuristic equation that what's really happening with recovery, and this is from the book that um, I wrote with Tom Carmichael, is a true recovery is requires a dose of behavioral training focused on impairment. You need to have a representation that was already dedicated to that function, but just needed to be upregulated. And that upregulation is due to some kind of plasticity environment, which happens to be stronger early after stroke. So basically, what is the milieu of plasticity? Is there residual representation? And can these two be exploited by a dose of behavioral training, okay? No reorganization anywhere in this equation, okay? So the implications for this north-south story, in other words, stop thinking about map changes and one area taking over another area of cortex and all that stuff. What you have to be thinking about, like I showed you in the Warren Darling study um, and what I was talking about at the beginning of this talk is we've got to do something, stop thinking east-west, don't talk about hemispheric inhibition and TMS over one hemisphere for the other. No, what you need to do is to do something about the strength of the residual descending corticospinal tract. Okay. Now, this is a review that Elvira Pirandini, Marco Capagrossi and I wrote recently in TINS where we sort of begin to make a case for switching from east-west stories to north-south stories when it comes to chronic stroke. Um, I'm not going to talk about early because I already showed you the, the, the quote from the dolphin study. In other words, this was us trying to go early, exploiting that early plasticity in the equation. But what about late? What happens when on those three terms in the equation? Sure, there might be some residual architecture. Sure, we can do some training, even with the dolphin. But what happens if the plasticity has gone away to normal levels? Well, the idea is that perhaps you can go in physiologically and do the equivalent of DBS for stroke. And so this is what we suggested in this paper, which is with Marco Capogrosso, Elvira Perandini, Doug Weber, and others, which is to actually implant epidural electrodes into the cervical spinal cord to treat stroke. In other words, this has been pioneering work by Gregoire Coutin and others in Switzerland, um, uh, and Susan Harkema and others, Reggie Edgerton, you know, this idea that you can do this invasively or non-invasively for spinal cord injury. But here the idea is to treat stroke, supratentorial stroke with cervical cord stimulation. The idea being that you can somehow amplify the quality of the residual cortical spinal tract signal so that the spinal cord receives better commands and you can do better motor control, okay? And here we just go through all the potential mechanisms why this might work. Again, I don't have time, I'm gonna stop in a minute, but the bottom line is that if you don't have a window of plasticity to exploit, maybe you can do a physiological intervention to substitute for that. And based on all that I've shown you, maybe we can get benefits in all the components of heavy paralysis that I introduced you at the beginning by just having an effect on the residual cortical spinal tract, okay? Is that true? <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> so this is a study in two patients, which is now published in Nature Medicine earlier this year, <clears throat> where in fact, we looked at all those components, weakness, uh, motor control, synergies, and we looked at them with the stimulator in the cervical cord on and off. These were two patients. Uh, this is a patient with a smaller lesion, 31-year-old woman. You can see the lesion in red. And this was a another 47-year-old woman with a larger lesion. Okay, and they had these electrodes implanted, amazing. And then they agreed to go through a battery of tests for a month. I mean, it really, you looked at the space, it looked like air traffic control or NORAD, physiologists, engineers, scientists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, all trying to see what this stimulation was doing in the patient. This is human neuroscience in my view at its finest, okay? And just to quickly finish, stimulating uh, the cervical spinal cord, um, actually led to an improvement in strength. Okay, so it's not even subtle. Here's elbow extension strength before, and here it is after. Here it is in black before and blue after. So that's strength, one of the components of hemiparesis. Motor control with weight support. Again, you saw significant improvements in kinematics, in other words, in arm dexterity, with the same stimulation. In other words, it was helping strength and it was helping kinematics, right? and it was improving function, all right? So in other words, maybe this master controller cortical spinal tract theory is true that you can in fact have a knock on effect on all the components of hemiparesis because the cortical spinal tract is controlling so many different things downstream from its origin in motor cortex. So I will finish there. Of course, this kind of work requires many, many, many people. Um, but I hope you can see at least the logic of this presentation, which is you need to know the biology of the phenotype of the steady state deficit. You then need to know the biology of spontaneous recovery to that steady state, no matter how far you might go. And then you have to start thinking about how are you going to, through behavioral interventions and perhaps physiological interventions and ultimately perhaps pharmacological interventions, do something about the deficit, both at steady state and early after stroke when you can actually exploit that plasticity window. Um, and I'll stop there. Thanks very much.